good evening to all the pg residents first of all let me thank dr girish kumar sir our principal and the organizers of this pg program i am sure these recordings will be of use to all the uh, student community the topic i am going to talk about today is concentration mechanism in urine formation so i will be discussing under the following headings why you need a concentration mechanism what are the components of this mechanism the concept of renal medullary gradient then all about counter counter current system in the kidney which is a very important topic both from examination point of view for both ug and pg and also from practicing side and lastly the factors which decide concentration of urine now concentration mechanism in urine formation it is just one of the five steps in urine formation you know the nephron you have got the glomerular filtration then tubular reabsorption tubular secretion then the concentration of urine and acidification which forms the five steps in urine formation why do you need a concentration of urine you know that the normal filtration rate or what you call gfr glomerular filtration rate is around 125 ml per minute that comes amounts to around 8 liters per hour or 180 liters per day and you can imagine what will be the issue if uh, is so high is passed out as 180 liters is passed as urine secondly 98% of water and solutes are all reabsorbed so that is important for water and electrolyte balance which is an important part of homeostasis which is maintenance of constancy of internal environment you already know that this electrolyte balance is very very important electrolyte balance the osmolarity of body fluids the ecf volume all these are very very important uh, for the well being of the patient any change in the electrolyte balance can result in disease process this is one of the electrolyte level serum electrolyte levels is one of the first test that you will do in the casualty both so this uh, water balance and all this is therefore very very important now coming to the concentration mechanism proper it has got two components the medullary gradient and plasma adh level so concentration is maintained by two mechanisms one is based on plasma adh level we'll see that later on and second is based on medullary gradient now what is this medullary gradient it is a gradient of increasing osmolarity from cortico medullary junction towards the bend of the loop of henle you can see here if you take a typical nephron this shows a juxta medullary nephron which has got certain characteristics like, like long loop of henle less of blood flow some features different from that of cortical nephron so for this we see that what is the fluid that is coming out of the proximal conductor tubule it is isotonic or isoosmotic with plasma that is because of obligatory reabsorption of solutes and water but beyond that you will see the osmolarity goes on increasing towards the bend of the loop and more osmolarity as you go down deeper into the medulla and as you go up again the osmolarity decreases but again when you come to collecting tubule the it will come hypertonic so you can see there is a increasing gradient of osmolarity from cortico medullary junction where it is around 300 milli osmoles to loop of henle or deep into the medulla near the tip of renal pyramids where it will be around 1200 milli osmoles per liter in the case of juxta medullary nephron around 600 milli osmoles in the case of cortical nephrons so that is what is called renal medullary gradient and this renal medullary gradient is 
created and maintained by what is called the counter current system so the created by counter current system loop of henle and maintained by what you call the vasa recta so loop of henle and the vasa recta they are the two components of the counter current system loop of henle which is called the counter current multiplier and maintained by vasa recta which is called counter current exchanger we will see later on by the time we finish describing this you will understand why this is called the creator and why rasa recta is called the exchanger or how it helps to maintain the gradillary gradient before that let us see what is this counter current system counter current system is a system in which the inflow runs parallel to close to and counter to the outflow for some distance i'll repeat again counter current system is a system in which the inflow and outflow are parallel to each other close to each other and counter to each other for some distance where is the other site where you see counter current the epididyme is for temperature maintenance in this scrotum so this counter current system how it helps in creating this medullary gradient so that's what we will see next so suppose you consider a straight pipe and the inflowing fluid has an osmolarity of 300 milli osmoles and there there is a source of osmolarity which increases the osmolarity to by 100 milli osmoles as it passes through the straight tube and the outflow will become 400 milli osmoles per liter so this is in case of straight pipe now instead of the straight pipe suppose you have a bend pipe u tube system just like in your uh, juxtamedullary nephron you will see that there is exchange of osmolarity not only from the source to the descending limb but also between ascending limb and descending limb why because they are close to each other actually it is closer than what i have shown in the diagram they are very close to each other so there will be exchange of osmolarity so that by the time this fluid reaches the bend of the loop and goes up it will become 400 and that will give the osmolarity to the descending so the next part of descending limb it will become 400 milli osmoles so now when that goes to the through the loop and comes to the other side that will become 500 milli osmoles and this will go on until you find that the osmolarity goes on increasing as you go down and decreasing as you go on that means it is it has created a gradient of osmolarity increasing from the uh, start of loop of henle and reaching a maximum 2200 in the bend of the loop so this is called the gradient of osmolarity which is classically seen in juxta medullary nephrons which constitute around 15% 15% 15 of the total nephrons okay so that is regarding the gradient now how this is possible this is because of the differential permeability of the descending and ascending limbs of loop of henle to water and solutes before we come to that you can see here there is a small gradient of 100 from 300 to 400 500 to 600 like the small gradient of osmolarity in the horizontal direction that is multiplied to four times that is 1200 in the vertical direction that is why you call the loop of henle as a counter current multiplier system so small gradient of 100 milli osmoles in horizontal direction multiplied in vertical direction to 1200 milli osmoles in the loop of henle now all this is possible all this is possible only because of differential permeability or difference in permeability of the loop of henle the different limbs you see that the descending 
limb of loop of heli is permeable only to water and solutes are totally impermeable so you will see as the fluid descends down as the tubular fluid comes down water is reabsorbed solutes are not reabsorbed so osmolality will go on increasing whereas as you ascend up you will see that it is totally impermeable to water and permeable to solutes only so the tonicity or osmolality will go on decreasing as you go up then again as it comes down the collecting tubule and collecting duct the osmolality will increase that is mainly by the adh mechanism so this loop of henle can function as counter current multiplier only because of this differential permeability of the two limbs of loop of henle to water and solutes so we will see that by the diagram you can see descending limb totally impermeable to solutes only water is permeable here ascending limb is permeable to solutes now you should have a source of osmolality as you saw in the previous diagram to raise the osmolarity what are the sources of this osmolarity this is by solute reabsorption characteristics which we have we, can, we have already seen in the previous uh, this um, uh, this qualities of this so here you see the descending limb of loop of henle no solute permeability in the ascending limb you can see that the solute that comes in is highly hypertonic or highly osmolar so the gradient for the sodium chloride all this will be towards the peritubular fluid that means there will be passive reabsorption of sodium and chloride whereas as you go up to the thick ascending limb now i forgot to mention the descending limb has only a thin segment in the uh, juxtamillary nephron ascending limb has a thin segment and a thick segment so thick segment why because here you will find that the, the gradient is lost because as you go up the tonal osmolarity has decreased the gradient for solutes that is uh, no downward gradient towards the peritubular fluid so you have to have an active reabsorption here so when you need an active reabsorption you need thick cells which have the mitochondria and all this characteristics provided for Uh, active reabsorption so you find in the thick ascending limb of loop of henle there is active reabsorption of one sodium one potassium and two chloride why one potassium one sodium two chloride because you have to maintain the electrical neutrality when a positive ion goes out it has to be accompanied by a negative ion or you should have another positive ion coming in but no secretion here only the reabsorption so you get one sodium one potassium two chloride and this is the primary force that's why i put it as a this is the primary force which constitutes the source for osmolarity primary source of osmolarity in the medullary interstitium as the most important source the second most important which i have marked as b is the urea reabsorption in the collecting duct which is dependent on a faculty you call it as facultative reabsorption it is dependent on adh that means only in presence of adh you can get urea and water reabsorption in the medullary collecting duct so we will see more about that when we come to role of adh in concentration mechanism we'll see more about the importance of this urea and water reabsorption here for the time being this urea reabsorption has a very important role or contribution to the osmolarity in the medullary interstitium then the other two important roles are one i told you passive reabsorption here and the last one in distal convoluted tubule it is to almost permea impermeable or uh, very uh, meek we weakly permeable as such but in presence of aldosterone it can reabsorb sodium and secrete potassium and in that process water also being reabsorbed so that is in the distal convoluted tubule aldosterone influence sodium reabsorption potassium secretion and water reabsorption so these are the factors a b c d which contribute to the osmolarity high osmolarity of medullary interstitium so we have already told this is possible because of difference in permeability urea and water reabsorption 
will complement each other so let us see how this water and urea reabsorption complement each other in the medullary collecting duct it is permeable one only in presence of adh so here when there is urea urea will move down the concentration gradient to the uh, so it is being reabsorbed so when the urea is reabsorbed into the interstitium because of higher the osmotic gradient water will be pulled along with it so more and more, more water is reabsorbed and when water is reabsorbed the concentration of urea inside the lumen that will increase and therefore that creates a gradient for urea reabsorption therefore urea again is being reabsorbed and again you know urea more here pulls in water so this goes on urea facilitating water reabsorption and water reabsorption facilitating urea reabsorption so this is what i said they complement each other urea and water reabsorption the medullary duct they will complement each other and urea is one of the main factors which increases osmolality i have shown this for convenience of the markings as so much distance but actually these are all very close to each other this descending limb this the collecting duct the blood vessels here the vasa recta what you call it all these are very close to each other and therefore there can be exchange between all this that is why the medullary gradient of osmolality here can help in all these mechanisms and you see here small amount of urea secretion also happens in the loop of henle now the question that often arises is why don't you get such a gradient in the renal cortex renal cortex which is the where the nephron the uh, cortical nephron which constitutes 85% of the total nephrons this cortical nephrons they are uh, situated almost totally in the cortex renal cortex or some part of it in the beginning part of medulla whereas juxta medullary nephrons only the uh, glomerulus part or the malpighian corpuscle is in the cortico medullary junction the rest of the loop and other parts dip deep into the medullary interstitium so why you don't get a gradient this is because of what you call the cortico medullary difference in blood flow cortex has a high blood flow so it can wash away the solutes whereas medulla slow blood flow so there is enough time this blood blood as well as the tubular fluid will remain in the tubule for a longer time will remain in the site for a longer time to permit exchange of solutes and water to take place whereas in the cortex very high blood flow so no time for such exchange it will wash away all the solutes to the circulation so it is only because of the cortico medullary difference in blood flow the cortico medullary difference in blood flow that you do not get such amount of concentration in the cortical nephron so there how much you get it goes from 300 to 600 milliosmoles whereas in juxta medullary nephron it goes from 300 to 1200 milliosmoles okay milliosmoles per liter so that is regarding the difference in the cortical and in the juxta medullary nephrons now we come to the second component of the counter current system what is called the counter current exchange system what we call vasa recta what is this vasa recta they are actually straight blood vessels running parallel to loop of henle in the seen only in juxta medullary nephrons you know that anywhere the capillary will break up into the uh, arti um, uh, afferent arterioles should break up into capillaries and they will form the uh, uh, glomerulus component of the malpighian corpuscle after that you have the efferent arteriole that is special for the kidney instead of arterioles the capillaries joining to form venules or anything here you have it forms the efferent arteriole and efferent arteriole after coming down it has to go to the venule side but instead of that it will form the peritubular capillaries which are network of capillaries that is seen in the cortical nephron whereas juxta medullary nephron instead of the uh, simple loop of peritubular capillaries this will become straight blood vessels which run deep down parallel to the loop of henle and they lie close to it so that is what is called the vasa recta 
and then the Vasar Akta after coming out will go on to the venules and so on. So, what are the characteristics of movement of solutes and water in the Vasar Akta? Here you find both the ascending and descending limbs of Vasarakta, they are freely permeable to both water and solutes. So the movement will be decided, unlike the loop where you have difference in permeability, here both the descending limb and the ascending limb freely permeable to both water and to solutes. So you find the movement is decided by the gradient that is created as it flows down this. So here you will find when it when the blood comes down the descending limb of Vasa recta, it is surrounded by high osmolarity. So what will happen? Water will go into the interstitium, solutes will go into the Vasa recta by the normal our forces, Starling's forces. You have solute movement towards the down the concentration gradient this also pulled out by osmolarity so you have water going out and solutes going in now as this flu as this blood goes down the loop and then comes to the ascending limb because of this exchange of water and solutes you will find the osmolarity becomes high higher 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 more solutes are put in water has gone out the osmolarity has become high so in the ascending limb the Vasa recta has high concentration, high osmolarity compared to surrounding. So here the reverse will happen, solutes will go into interstitium, water will come into the Vasa recta. So ultimately what happens, water has come out but gone back into the circulation or water bypasses the Vasa recta and goes back into the circulation. So no dilution of the solutes here and whatever solute was taken away is put back into the interstitium so the high concentration of solutes and the osmolarity is maintained. So because of this exchange you call the Vasa recta as counter current exchanger and this is how by taking away water and putting back solutes it maintains the gradient that was created by the counter current multiplier system. So that is the functioning of Vasa recta uh, as countercurrent exchange system. It maintains the high osmotic gradient that was created by the loop of Henle. So to sum up we have countercurrent multiplier system is the loop of Henle and countercurrent exchange system is a Vasa recta. Because of the special permeability of these two structures we find that solutes that are put in by the um, multiplier system they remain in the interstitium whereas water which has entered to dilute it that is taken away into the general circulation okay i hope that is clear and this all this is possible because of the less blood flow or corticomedullary difference in blood flow less blood flow in the medulla compared to the cortex so there is sufficient time for the exchange of all this to take place now we come to the next component. We saw earlier that the uh, concentration mechanism is by two factors. One is the countercurrent system. You saw that the concentration mechanism depends on two factors. One is your medullary gradient, which depends on the countercurrent system, which again depends on the permeability of loop of Henle and permeability characteristics of Vasa recta and few sources of osmolarity. So we have seen all that. Now we will come to the next component in concentration of urine what is called plasma ADH mechanism. Plasma ADH level. ADH you know is produced by hypothalamus. So they are sensitive, there are osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus which will sense what is the osmolarity of body fluids. Besides that, you have the uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, RAS mechanism, which also gives a feedback. That is, you have the you, you will have learned all about the 
uh, juxta glomerular apparatus where you have the macula densa cells in the distal conductor tubule which senses the sodium concentration the osmolality of the fluid flowing through the distal conductor tubule gives us message to the uh, juxta glomerular cells in the juxta metal uh, glomerular apparatus and they will adjust the amount of renin secretion that will activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and also the ADH system. So the ADH level or antidiuretic hormone level that will be decided by the osmolality of body fluids which is again sensed by the hypothalamus osmoreceptors. So when there is more of ADH what does this ADH do? What is the target organ? This ADH release goes to a posterior pituitary stored there and it will be released as and when necessary. So this ADH or antidiabetic hormone, the target organ is your medullary collecting duct. So in the medullary collecting duct, this ADH will combine with what you call V2 receptors or vasopressin 2 receptors. You know, vasopressin 2, ADH is also called vasoreceptor vasopressin because in physiological doses it has antidiuretic action, in pharmacological doses it has got vasopressor action. So you call it also as vasopressin. Therefore, vasopressor receptors, vasopressin receptors are V2 receptors which are found in the luminal membrane of the collecting tubule and collecting them. So ADH will combine with these receptors and the rough effect will cause more number of aquaporins too. Aquaporins nothing but water channels. These water channels with which are present as um, vesicular tubular vesicular structures in the cytoplasm. These vesicles will be inserted into the luminal membrane and they will form water channels which you call aquaporin 2 and through that water reabsorption occurs and this also allows the urea reabsorption through urea transporter 2 you call it UTA2 urea transporter this urea transporter 2 and that is also present the collecting duct so through this urea and water reabsorption will occur and that is called we call it as facultative reabsorption of water because a faculty or a monitor is monitoring whether the water and urea should be reabsorbed or not depending on our body needs so that is how the plasma ADH level helps in urea and water reabsorption the collecting duct if you need less of this uh, concentration then these vesicular structures the aquaporins will be withdrawn uh, into the cytoplasm they will lie in the lining cells the tubular vesicular structures when again there is need they will be inserted so this happens and by this you can adjust the urea and water reabsorption in the collecting duct so coming back to the first slide what we were seeing you can see we have seen why concentration mechanism in the urine formation is needed what are the two components of this mechanism that is the medullary gradient and the plasma ADS level what is this medullary gradient what contributes to the medullary gradient that is about the countercurrent system the two components the loop of Kenley which functions as countercurrent multiplier and is responsible for creating the gradient the vasa recta which functions as countercurrent multiplier uh, the exchange system which helps in uh, maintaining the gradient that is already created and then we have seen about why the counter loop is called counter multiplier and why the uh, vasa recta is called as counter exchanger and all this is possible only because of difference in permeability of the different limbs of loop of Henle to water and solutes whereas the vasa recta both the limbs are freely permeable to water and solutes and therefore the movement is decided by the concentration gradients that are created and we have also seen all this uh, there is a source of osmolality which is due to the four reabsorptions that I have shown primarily the, the ascending thick ascending limb where you have one sodium one potassium two chloride reabsorption the uh, secondly the urea reabsorption the collecting that thirdly the aldosterone dependent water and sodium reabsorption in the distal counter tubule and lastly the passive reabsorption of water in the thin descending ascending limb of loop of Henle. We have also seen why you have thick and thin ascending limbs and why it is passive in thin ascending limb and why you get active in thick ascending limb for reabsorption. And then we have also seen what is the ADH mechanism by which this water and urea are reabsorbed. 
now coming to the last point in this what are the other factors which help in concentration mechanism urine formation one is the loop of hill you saw that medullary gradient osmolality goes on increasing as you go deeper into the loop so a longer loop it will go deeper into the uh, high concentration area and there will be more concentration of urine then second is we saw urea was the second most important factor so urea availability which will depend on your protein intake so urea availability and lastly the blood flow in the vasa recta we have seen there is a slower blood flow more time for reabsorption and therefore the blood flow in the vasa recta that will also decide and also the rate of urine flow to some extent because urea reabsorption is dependent on the rate of urine flow you have got two types of clearance for urea you may have heard the standard clearance and the maximal clearance so you find that urea if it is the urine is flowing very fast then there is no time for urea reabsorption so the urine flow rate will also uh, um, will be a deciding factor which will um, uh, decide how much is the urea that is available for reabsorption and that in turn will contribute to the concentration mechanism so i hope the this is there if there is any questions you can please post it to my email id um, i okay, i have not given i forgot to give this saraswati l at aims dot amrita dot edu so any questions can be posted in that thank you